Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Welcome to the Friday edition of Balance of Power. You made it to the threshold of the weekend. And this ought to be a fun one if you care about this stuff. Maybe you're getting turned off by the celebrity. But we've got a big Joe Rogan interview, the podcast today. Donald Trump is in Texas, in Austin, for that recording. I suspect a few people will hear it. And he's going there because, well, Kamala Harris was already planning to be in Texas. She's in Houston. Yes, with Beyonce and Willie Nelson. A big rally there planned for tonight as she tries to seize on the issue of reproductive rights. Abortion, of course, noting Texas's abortion ban. That's the backdrop for her And we're going to go cascading into a weekend of showbiz and celebrity that will culminate on stage at Madison Square Garden, where Donald Trump has rented out the room for a million dollars. And I'm deeply curious to see who shows up, because this is a big battle of the celebrities, right? Thanks for joining us on Bloomberg Radio, on the satellite, and on YouTube, where you can find us right now by searching Bloomberg Business News Live. This is right around the time when the national anxiety reaches a fever pitch. People are starting to turn off newscasts, turning away from the doom scroll, even though I know you're looking when we're not watching. Because we have another poll today that says what we already told you yesterday and what you're probably feeling, and that's why the anxiety exists. It's a tie. Yesterday, Bloomberg swing state poll, remember 49-49 in the seven swing states, Not just like a statistical tie, a real tie. And today, it's the New York Times-Siena College. Remember, we've talked to Don Levy a lot around here. 48-48 in their poll. So we do have some consistency, which is pretty interesting. I want to bring in Laura Davison at this moment because she is feeling the collective anxiety every day. This is what she does. Bloomberg politics editor with 11 days to go. How are you holding up? You know, we're going to be in there. We're almost down to single <laughs> yeah, digits. You are. And, uh, you know, it is tighter than ever, which mm-hmm. uh, I think just adds to the fun. That's right. Tighter than a tube sock, as Dan Rather would have said. Um, interesting to see another poll like this, right? We were just talking about the Bloomberg Morning Consult poll yesterday to see an entirely different organization with a presumably different sample to come to essentially the same result. Tells you what? It tells us that this is a really, really close race. And sort of what we saw over the past, uh, you know, kind of uh, August, September time period where Harris was kind of steadily gaining, steadily gaining, that has really uh, tightened off as a lot of people, uh, you know, those undecideds have, you know, finally tuned in and said, look, I'm either going to, you know, land on Harris's side, land on Trump's side, and that there's just this teeny, 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 tiny sliver of people in the middle who are still undecided. And that's Mm -hmm. why you see the star power, the the Beyonce, the Joe Rogan, um, you know, the candidates are going out trying to reach to people who, you know, do do not want to listen to political news regularly. Before, yeah, God love him. Before we get into the star power, does this Rogan interview, I mean, he was saying nice things about RFK Jr. Does it end up being an endorsement? Do we know? Is this going to be a challenging interview? What are you expecting to come from this? You know, I, this will be a one, it'll be a long interview. That's what yeah. Rogan does. You know, we could sure. have, you know, two or three hours of, you three know, Trump hours. with Rogan um, <laughs> sitting down. Uh, you know, Rogan did endorse RFK Jr. He, or, you know, sort of said he supported That's him. That's right. Yeah. And then he also said some nice things about Harry. After that debate, he said that, you know, Harris, you know, was very polished, that she was well prepped and that Trump was flailing a little bit. You know, that was remember the debate about Springfield and eating the cats and dogs. Um, You know, Rogan in the past has espoused a lot of the same ideas that Trump has. You know, Mm -hmm. this is very much a a podcast that is geared towards young men, people who are very online, dabbling in conspiracy theory. Um, So this is sort of a a key audience for for Trump. Um, But, you know, I don't think he needs necessarily the you know explicit endorsement. He doesn't Mm -hmm. need Joe Rogan to say the words, I endorse you. Just having him on the show and having a what will probably be a relatively friendly conversation is enough to get Trump what he needs. Does something wacky happen? Does Rogan light a joint in this interview the way he did with Elon Musk? Does Elon Musk show up with him? It's in Austin, right? Do they roll in there together maybe? Highly possible, though. Elon mm-hmm. Musk is spending a lot of time in Pennsylvania these days That's doing get-out-the-vote efforts, but yeah. expect that there will be all sorts of pageantry, <laughs> all sorts of, uh, you know, fun surprises. We're you know, this is the pageantry. You know, because it's not really news. This is entertainment. So thank the, Well, thank you for saying that. That's true. Okay, so let's get into that for a minute. Because everybody's saying that Kamala Harris is surrounding herself, and t- Democrats tend to be embraced by Hollywood. This 
thing last night. My God, I mean, I was just watching. It's like entertainment tonight. You have Bruce Springsteen out there, Tyler Perry, uh, Samuel L. Jackson. Who else was speaking before Kamala Harris? It was one after the other, one celeb after the other. But when you think about it, Donald Trump has quite a bit of celebrity power beyond Hulk Hogan and Dana White. He's got arguably one of the most famous people in the world named Elon Musk, who's also putting tens of millions of dollars into the campaign. So this is really something that's being used by both sides, isn't it? This this really is. And you see, you know, Musk is hosting his own events. You know, he was out, uh, you know, in the past several days holding all these, uh, you know, events in high school auditoriums in Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, we had some reporters on the ground talking to people there. And some of these folks were saying, look, I'm here because I'm an Elon fan. And mm. I because I like Musk, <laughs> you know, that kind of opened my uh, my eyes to Trump. So this is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of a, a, a thing that works, uh, you know, in Trump's favor in many ways. Um, you know, even though he is perhaps the most well-known person in the world, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, some a star power, someone who kind of is seen as cool. Yeah. as Musk is, uh, you know, supporting him is, is super helpful. And another 43 million, I think we were reporting that he's added to the kitty here. Yes, another Trump. more than 43 million. That wow. puts his total for, you know, both uh, Trump as well as, you know, Republicans down yeah. the ballot, uh, you know, somewhere around 132 million at least. Incredible. Which means that he goes from being basically a, you know, someone who don doesn't donate at all to being probably he'll end up in the top five for mm -hmm. this election cycle, which is huge. I wonder what happens if Donald Trump doesn't win. Is Elon Musk go to the White House, sit down? I don't know. Um, good luck this weekend. Deep breaths. You're doing great. We're relying on you, Laura Davison. Bloomberg Politics Editor. Imagine being in charge of, at this moment, the sensitive moment of all the content that's going on the terminal and on the website. That's Laura. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington, and glad you're with us here as we zero in specifically on one of the swing states that we've been talking about. The seven, of course, include Arizona, and it's ground zero for early voting. Because in Arizona, this is nothing new. Republicans and Democrats have been doing this for many cycles in Arizona because of the heat, because of the long way you have to drive in a lot of these instances and a lot of other reasons. So we've been watching very closely Republican and uh, Democratic ballots in the states that we can. And we want to zero in on Arizona with an expert. Sam Almy is a Democratic political strategist and head of a, 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 a data at a company called Uplift. I have been reading about Sam in just about every major newspaper on the daily all week. Because if you want to know what's going on with early voting in Arizona, this is who you call. Sam, welcome to Bloomberg and Balance of Power. It's great to see you. Uh, give me a sense, because you're on the ground looking at the latest numbers, where we stand with the early vote in Arizona today. All right. Thanks, Joe. Uh, right now, today, I just updated my numbers about 15 minutes before I got on the show here. We're at 1.2 million returns statewide. That gives us a turnout of about 28%. Uh, I think we're ending. We're looking to end up around uh, probably 77, 76%. Uh, how the parties break down right now? We have 420,000 Democratic ballots, 500,000 GOP ballots, and uh, 274,000 Independent ballots. So, give us a little historical perspective here and how that compares to 20 and 16. Are the two parties on track with what you expected? Yeah, th this is where it gets really interesting uh, for, for, little, for wonks like me. Uh, compared to 2020, this looks very different for, for Democrats. Uh, for Republicans, they're on pace with their, they're a little bit ahead of their 2020 pace. Democrats are way further behind on their 2020 pace. They're, they're down about 9% in overall turnout. Uh, mm -hmm. But as we all know, 2020, that was a weird year. If we look back <laughs> to if we look back to 2016, everything's on pace. Uh, Democrats are, are uh, about two percent ahead uh, in turnout of where they were. Same for Republicans. Independents, however, mm -hmm. they're down about one percent. Uh, so it, it, it's really uh, tricky for, for people like me to find that that right sweet spot of, a, of a, an election to uh, compare to. Mm -hmm. Understood. So does that give us a sense then that the RNC got its arms around the messaging here, even as Donald Trump has called early voting stupid and dangerous? Or, or does it suggest a normalizing coming out of a pandemic election? This, this is really confounding for me, too. I think early in our, our, our voting periods in the first week, we saw a lot of early in-person voting, which is not very mm -hmm. popular in Arizona, because as, as you mentioned, we've had about two decades of 
early by mail voting. Uh, it's very safe, very secure. People love it. All parties use it. Uh, but I think we saw some very hard partisans uh, who are very engaged on the GOP side. They are making a compromise saying, OK, I'm going to vote early, but I'm not going to do it by the mail. So they do it uh, early in person. OK, that's actually really interesting color. And you kind of have to be there to know about this. Arizona is not the only one we're watching. If you consider some of the other states uh, that are in play here, where we actually have a breakdown on Democrats and Republicans, the GOP is doing pretty well. If you look at Nevada, for instance, Sam, it's not just Arizona where we're seeing this. Is this a national trend? Uh, it, it, it probably is. Uh, just if you compare to 2020, there's a lot of anti-vote by mail sentiment. Turns out, Voting by mail is safe, easy, and convenient. Uh, the GOP has, has decided to embrace that. Uh, they're, they are on pace with their 2020 and 2016 uh, turnout numbers right now. The story in Arizona uh, has been pretty fascinating, and I know that we're here to talk about uh, pulling ballots, uh, but there are questions about ballot splitting here where you've got a Senate race and a presidential campaign that just don't seem to align unless Republicans are leaving something blank or Democrats are deciding to vote for Donald Trump. How do you rationalize the narrative right now in Arizona? Yeah, that that is that is going to be a really interesting thing. Uh, in 20, uh, 2020, the GOP, the GOP has always had a registration advantage over the Democrats. Uh, in, in 2020, it was about 120,000, 130,000. 2020, uh, 2016, uh, it was closer to uh, 150,000. Right now, the advantage for Republicans is, is closer to 300,000 ballots. So both the presidential and U.S. Senate campaign are going to have to rely heavily on these ticket splitting Republicans uh, that are t that are turned off by the the, the MAGA type politics uh, that follow, you know, our, our former U.S. Senator John McCain. Uh, the, hmm. Our top of the ticket campaigns are really going to heavily rely on, on those ticket splitting Republicans. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, when it comes to overall turnout, when do you start to draw conclusions you've got i think until november 1st right is it going to be throughout next week by the end of next week you're going to be able to take a stab at what overall turnout in this election will be like when you include actual election day voting yeah i that's that's another thing i, I actually looked a couple of days ago and my turnout projection was was just so low i i didn't i i had to throw <laughs> it out uh so i'm, I'm oh. going to take a look probably probably in the next couple of days uh, i know one of our, our major counties pima county was they had a little bit of a delay in sending out ballots so their their returns are about three days behind where they have been in the past couple cycles uh you know I, I still am expecting overall turnout to to be a little bit less than our 80 percent record high in 2020, but not like any any sort of record low or anything like that. Sure. Understood. The, the other we're dealing with hard numbers here. Go ahead, Sam. Finish. Your yeah. Talk. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So one of the other things that I'm I'm very curious about is I'm comparing this. I'm, I'm starting to look at 2018 data because that's when mm -hmm. there was the uh, the red mirage of. Republicans built up a huge early ballot lead, but Democrats turned out on election day uh, where they dropped off their early ballots and showed up and voted at the polls. How about that? You know, the question I've got to ask you that you don't want to answer is when they're going to call the state of Arizona. Oh, uh, it's not going to be on November 5th. I'll tell you that. Uh, I believe I, you. <laughs> yeah, I, I would probably I would probably guess at uh, probably a week later uh but I'm, I'm pretty conservative with that estimate yeah uh, wow. i would i wouldn't if, if we have results on the 9th or 10th that weekend i'd be pretty mm -hmm. surprised and that's because of the distances involved and the time it takes to count all these early ballots yeah absolutely um you know usually at the when when the polls close uh, there are a lot of early ballots that are simply dropped off at the polls. We have about half a million. Mm -hmm. We have to verify those. We have to uh, make sure that they are valid, and then we count them. Man, he's right in the thick of it. Sam, I appreciate you taking time for us today. Sam Almy, Democratic political strategist. He's at Uplift, where he's the head of data and tracking the ballots as they drop. That's real-time stuff you'll only hear on Bloomberg. 
You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We've been having for the last several days about how this is a 50 50 election, a toss up, a coin flip. We aren't sure who will win. It looks like it is dead even. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy might be slightly more sure than the rest of us, not by much, but he gives Harris 60% odds of winning, Donald Trump 40%. Mm. And Terry is with us now here on Bloomberg TV I gotta hear and this. radio. So, Terry, provide the justification here. What everyone's saying 50 50, don't trust your gut. We can't call this. No one credibly can. Why do you see it as more likely that Harris pulls this out at this point? Well, well, the, one of the first things I ever learned about markets uh, many years ago was that 50-50 is no call at all. And uh, <laughs> if you're in the calling business, you better make a call. <laughs> and, you know, likely, you know, for, for good or ill, you know, I'm in the call business. So, you know, you, you, if in a true 50-50 race, you got to move to the intangibles. And I think Harris has the better uh, the better argument. Uh, she's got, I think, a better uh, get out the vote turnout machine. I think there's higher voter enthusiasm for her. I think she's had greater message discipline that enables people to be uh, voters to be motivated. Uh, yeah, and that, that's on both social issues, I think, and uh, Trump loathing. Uh, there's this kind of tabula rasa appeal about Harris, I think, has uh, diminished some uh, recently when she gets specific about issues. But uh, but that's been out there. And frankly, there's a lack of serious policy difference between the two candidates. It's not as if we're talking about you know, whether the federal government ought to be involved in providing health care or not. It's a matter of uh, shade, gradations. And, uh, hmm. you know, so there's there's nothing that, that, that's kind of a, a big issue that's going to turn the uh, the public on or off uh, other than the social issues I already mentioned. So, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, she gets the better of it. But, you know, I've got Trump at 40 percent and uh, he can still surprise the upside. Uh, but I do think that there's a very hard ceiling that's been demonstrated all year with Trump. I know your ears were burning uh, when I was talking about you on the air earlier this week, Terry, because you have the note of the moment. Hmm? Drunks leaning on lampposts, of course, <laughs> invoking the great Vin Scully. Quote, statistics are used much as a drunk uses a lamppost. This great old saying for support, not illumination. With that said, everybody's given us a gut check now, and we have a couple of other factors here. Nate Silver, by the way, in a, a guest essay in the New York Times, says his gut points to Trump. And he points to shy voter theory, non-response bias, the undersampling of Donald Trump. He's got potentially some things going in his favor, too, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, look, there's a lot of different uh, shades to this, and uh, you know, any one of them can uh, can surprise. You know, my threshold issue on this all along, and people talk about issue, issue, issue. The threshold issue mm -hmm. is is uh, is is the credibility of Harris as a president. That's an issue for good or ill that Trump doesn't have because, as much because he actually has been a president. So you you know you have your own opinion about that. But uh, it's the credibility of Harris, and you know she's going to continue to hammer that in in two ways. One, by continuing to make the case for herself. That's what this ellipse visit is about next week, uh, rally. Mm. Uh, and secondly, uh, you know, she's going to continue to make the case that Trump is, uh, has disqualified himself for a variety of reasons. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, she hangs her hat on that because that everything else flows from that. If you think if you as a voter think Harris isn't qualified or is anything else, uh, then you know you make a different choice. But if Harris and Trump are mm -hmm. both in the conversation, Harris is more so. Uh, then you know she's passed the first and most important test, and she's got the likelier ability, I think, to to uh, to convince a voter. So let's talk about convincing the financial markets, Terry, because there was a lot of conversation this week about what we were seeing in the bond market, specifically a sell-off, uh, pressure upward on yields, and a lot of people were pointing to fiscal policy concern. Forget about what the Federal Reserve is doing for a second. When you look at the policy proposals that both of them have put forward uh, during this campaign, perhaps that is something that is a little frightening to the bond market at this time. What do you see as actual reality that the market should be paying attention to? How worried should they be? about fiscal discipline or lack thereof, but from both of these candidates, regardless of who wins the presidency, but considering who might win control of Congress. 
Well, they're right. They're absolutely right to be hugely concerned about the candidates. I mean, and not just because uh, they went through this whole Oprah phase of their uh, campaigns where they were promising uh, lots of things to lots of people. Uh, markets uh, once once every four years, markets forget what they know the other three years, which is that the that it's really the Congress that's more important to the the policy equation than the president, and. You know, so what uh, markets always do, what analysts always do, is they put out these, you know, baskets of stocks, Trump baskets and Harris baskets, and how this is going to, uh, how this is going to affect. The assumption is wrong, though. The assumption is somehow that the president provides a gravitational pull, when in fact it's much more of the opposite. You get a situation where, uh, you know, 2017 tax law is a perfect example of this. Uh, Trump and a, an all Republican Congress made it possible, but the all Republican Congress, you know, decided how low the rates could be, decided the specifics, all the rest. Trump was essentially uh, limited to details and making sure he got uh, he got the thing signed. Anybody that doubts that Congress is more important than the president when it comes to the vast majority of economic policies has only to ask Jimmy Carter how energy policy went, how George W. Bush, uh, ask George W. Bush how Social Security went, or ask Obama about pretty much anything after 2010, which he, when he couldn't get anything through thanks to the makeup of Congress, so it, including a lot of trade law so, um, and trade treaties. So. Uh, Congress, the makeup of Congress here is more important for policy, and the makeup of Congress is about 70 percent likely to be a tiny Democratic majority in the House and a tiny Republican majority in the Senate mm -hmm. uh, that guarantees a lot of things. But one is that uh, there's not going to be any uh, serious action on fiscal debt and deficit uh, going forward. That seems to be true. Is that how you're looking at the, the results on the Hill? I know we're going to be waiting a while probably to find out about the House, but the conventional wisdom uh, seems to be pretty consistent here, Terry. Tough map for Democrats in the Senate and a likely pickup yeah. to have a, a speaker, Hakeem Jeffries. Well, yeah, I think so. The, uh, you know, the, the path for Democrats in the House has been evident and likely uh, since the day after the election in 2022. Uh, they need to pick up some uh, some seats they lost to Republicans in largely blue states, uh, New York and California, and they're, they're likelier than not to do that. At the same time, you got a Senate map that where you you have you know seven or eight competitive races on the on the Democratic side, all of which they have to sweep to maintain ma a majority. Uh, are they likely to do that? They've never been likely to do that, and now it's apparent that they probably won't. Uh, is you know I'll give you thirty percent uh, that one or both of those is wrong, but those are by far the likeliest results. So what you get on that, I think, is post-election you get negative fiscal debt and deficit. You get uh, negative on tax since Democrats won't want. To to, uh, to ratify an extension of the 2017 tax law. I think you you get negatives on tariffs because I think what markets don't understand is tariffs are not only you know part of the policy in both parties now, but they're going to get yeah. bigger because of national security concerns, mm -hmm. which both, both candidacies are talking about. Uh, and I think you're positive for defense and defense industrial base, frankly. So... Uh, you know, that's what they're going to be looking at going forward. It's a mistake to think that uh, yeah. whatever is uh, just being discussed today is what's going to be discussed after the election. Terry, we've got 30 seconds left. You, yeah. Michigan, consumer sentiment hit a six month high in data today. What political signal does that send? Uh, I think it doesn't send much of anything. You've got a situation where the vast majority of voters are baked in, number one, uh, generally, on who they like. Secondly, uh, they're baked in on how they feel about the economy already. You know, if you're... Uh uh, if, if you're a, in a Western Pennsylvania and you're se severely affected by high prices, uh, you're not going to magically feel better uh, hmm. in the last month or so. The line to remember from Terry's note I mentioned, investors are wise to keep the full salt shaker on hand. From Pangea Policy, good to see you, Terry Haynes. This is Bloomberg TV and Radio. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. The home stretch of this election cycle with just 11 days to go until Election Day, which means it is closing arguments time. We've been running through many of the closing arguments we've seen from these two presidential campaigns here on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio for the last several days. But to reiterate, 
For Kamala Harris, in part, it focuses on reproductive rights. That will be highlighted in her visit to Texas today with Beyonce. She's focusing on the issue of abortion in a state which has very restrictive policies in that regard. But she also was in Georgia yesterday. Former President Barack Obama was there rallying with her, and she was focusing on the other closing message that we have seen her reiterate time and again, that Donald Trump is unfit for office and a danger to democracy. Someone who suggests we should terminate the Constitution of the United States of America should never again stand behind the seal of the President of the United States of America. Let's assemble our signature panel here on the Friday edition of Balance of Power. J.D. Shanzano, Bloomberg Politics contributor, Democratic analyst, and political science professor at Iona University, joined by Rick Davis, of course, Republican strategist partner at Stone Court Capital. So here's the way the closing arguments, at least the bumper sticker versions, are boiling down. And we talked to Jim Messina about this right around this time yesterday. For Kamala Harris, it's she has a to-do list, he has an enemy list. For Donald Trump, it's she broke it. Trump can fix it. Which one resonates, Rick? Look, I mean, if you take a look at how people feel about the direction of the country, you know, significantly negative. Uh, We've been talking about the consumer sentiment index well lower than a party in power wants to see it uh, going into an election. Uh, They broke it. He's going to fix it is a very compelling argument. I suspect he'd be doing even better in this election if he would not go into these various controversial places he's been and just said that over and over. This would not be a close election. And yet it is one, Jeannie. So it raises the question of how effective Harris's closing argument actually is. If this is making if she is making it too much about him and not enough about her, does she need to course correct on that in the in the next 11 days, including tonight in Texas? No, I don't think so. I think it is an effective message because it resonates with what she has been trying to tell these voters out there, which is that Donald Trump is all about himself. Just listen to him. Just watch him go to his rallies. And I am about you. I'm going to be working for you. So I think as a message, it works. I do think her event tonight is really important. She starts the year on abortion and reproductive health. She's going to end it there. And as we look at these polls that are coming out just in the last few days, abortion is a winning issue for her. And Texas, of course, has one of the most restrictive abortion laws, not even an exception for rape or incest, only an exception for the life of the mother. And of course, they have been focusing on women and men who want children and who have not been able to get the health care they need because doctors down there are scared they are facing 99 years in jail. So it's an effective strategy. And of course, she's got the queen bee down there with her. How could she lose? (laughs) That's a fair point. Rick, we talked earlier in the program with a man named Sam Almy. You might know him as, of course, a veteran of Arizona politics, although he's a Democrat and he's been monitoring the early vote, specifically counting ballots here for D's and R's. We have an important story on the terminal, and you've talked to us about this before. Right now, more registered Republicans have voted in Arizona, Nevada, and North Carolina than Democrats have. This is public data. This is not something we're speculating on. It's not a poll. And so what does it mean for the final outcome in this election, Rick? Yeah, some of those places like Arizona that you mentioned uh, have a long history of Republicans voting early uh, by Mm -hmm. turning in their ballots or vote by mail. So that's not a surprise. And I think, you know, that was borne out by your guest earlier. Uh, And Republican registrations are up in in a lot of these places. So you just have a larger pool of voters to pull from than we did uh, four years ago. Uh, that being said, um, you 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 do see big disparaging, uh, uh, d- big desperate numbers in places like Pennsylvania and specifically around the collar counties of Philadelphia, where I think the election in Pennsylvania will be decided. Uh, and in those places, Democrats are voting at a higher frequency with bigger margins than they had before. And in places like Bucks County, Uh, You really wonder how many of those could be Republicans voting for Kamala Harris since that's been the focus of her efforts there. So, 
you know, it's just like the polling. The early vote is a mixed bag. If you if you want to take a partisan point of view on it, you can make a case very easily for Democrats doing better or Republicans doing better. Uh, it just depends upon which state you think you're going to win. But, Rick, if we consider the fact that, well, we don't know who Republicans are voting for. Republicans are showing out up to vote, despite some of the rhetoric we have heard from Donald Trump about uh, that as a as a voting method. He's called it stupid at one point during this cycle. This is the RNC who has kind of forced this to happen, right? For all of the conversation we have had here on Balance of Power over the course of the last many, many months about how Donald Trump is not necessarily a candidate. You can discipline the campaign. The RNC can only control this so much. They have been able to control this in some sense. What does that say? Yeah, I'm not sure it's the RNC controlling this. Um, okay. The reality is Arizona, again, good example, right? Republicans are voting at a higher level, um, uh, higher levels of uh, registration. The RNC has not been on the ground in Arizona doing any of that. Um, there's a very small get out the vote operation in Arizona, a fraction of which would be normal uh, compared to um, you know previous presidential election cycles. So uh, look, I mean, you know, and when you look at how these voting patterns are, are changing, um, uh, all of these uh, early voting patterns are different than in 2022, which were significantly different than in 2020. So uh, what is what are we comparing it to? Are we comparing it to the 22 get out the vote efforts in early voting, uh, which actually look a lot more like what's happening today than in 2020 or 2016? So uh, look, I, we've talked a lot about how this is a replay of the 2020 elections when Biden and Trump were mm. In, but the reality is it's a unique election and it's performing differently than any previous presidential election. Really fascinating as well. When you consider what both campaigns want us to be talking about today, we've, we've already gone there. Uh, Kamala Harris going to be talking about reproductive rights. Yep, Beyonce by her side in Texas. Donald Trump is going to be sitting down with Joe Rogan. They're doing the podcast this afternoon. I suspect a lot of people, Jeannie, are going to watch and hear it. And when you look at the gender gap in this campaign, we've spent some time on this, men versus women. It's underscored again in the Siena College New York Times poll. Harris leads Trump among women, 54 to 42 percent. Trump leads Harris among men, 55 to 41 percent. What they're doing today is not going to change this. It might actually make it worse. Jeannie, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it really shows you they're both in Texas. I don't think we'd ever have thought that 11 days to go, they find themselves in a state where Donald Trump's definitely going to win. But it is in part because of these issues that appeal to their support supporters for Donald Trump. That's immigration for, you know, obviously Kamala Harris, that's abortion. And of course, Donald Trump is down there to talk to Joe Rogan. I think the last time I checked, he has like 190 million uh, downloads a day <laughs> on his, or maybe it's a month, it's gotta be a month, right? On his podcast. And it, it's just incredible numbers. Lots of those young men. Um, and I just am so fascinated by this interview because She's, you know, not that far away. Does she like go out and, mm -hmm. you know, stalk them? I don't know. Does Elon Musk show up and light mm -hmm. up like he's done with Joe Rogan in the past? So much can go wrong with this interview. And it's going to be like typical Joe Rogan, three hours. So I'm fascinated by it. And I really hope that Kamala Harris surprises us with one of her own on Joe Rogan. But mm -hmm. so far, we don't get that. Well, speaking of a following, Elon Musk has two and 202 million followers on X, the platform, of course, that he owns. He also, according to new reporting from The Wall Street Journal that hit yesterday, has been in communication with Russian President Vladimir Putin, just as we also have questions about Donald Trump's own communication with Putin since he left the White House, remembering Bob Woodward's uh, new book that suggests they had spoken on multiple occasions since Trump was president. Remember, our Bloomberg editor-in-chief, John Micklethwaite, asked Trump directly about this, and this is how it went. Well, I don't comment on that, but I will tell you that. If I did, it's a smart thing. If I'm friendly with people, if I have a relationship with people, that's a good thing, not a bad thing, in terms of a country. He's got 2,000 nuclear weapons, and so do we. Uh, China has a lot less, but they'll catch us within five years. Jeannie, we've got a minute left here. Even if Donald Trump isn't directly communicating uh, with Putin privately, what would it say if Elon Musk, who has been so who has become so close to him and his campaign, is doing so? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it just reinvigorates the conversation, which is really important about Donald Trump's relationship with Vladimir Putin. And, you know, you listen to Donald Trump in that interview, and what does he say? Oh, it, it's important to be friendly with everybody, especially somebody who has this many nuclear weapons. The reality is the United States has a president right now. Former presidents don't talk to autocratic leaders of other nations without going through the government. At least it's not good form. And so the fact that he may have done that and his number one donor apparently may be doing it as well is deeply, deeply concerning to the security of the United States. All right, Jeannie Shanzano of the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress alongside Rick Davis of Stonecourt Capital, both of them Bloomberg Politics contributors, are always closing us out uh, on every single Friday. Thank you both so much for being here. And Joe, we're going to continue the conversation around Vladimir Putin and his ongoing war with Ukraine coming up next as Melinda Herring will be joining us from the Atlantic Council. I can only imagine what went through her mind when yeah. she heard about this. By the way, uh, the head of NASA, Bill Nelson, talking to Semaphore about this just a short time ago, uh, Kaylee says, if true, the Pentagon and NASA would be concerned and it should be investigated. We'll have a lot more on this coming up. Indeed, we will. So stay with us here on Balance of Power, live from both Washington and New York today, right here on Bloomberg TV and radio. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Turning our attention to geopolitics and a story that is impossible to separate from the presidential election that's, of course, underway right now here. We've heard from President Zelensky, Kaylee. Uh, following up on a story that we discussed earlier this week with Ambassador James Jeffrey, Ukraine expects a major change in the dynamic on the battlefield this weekend. In fact, expects Russia to start using North Korean troops mm -hmm. in combat, in theater, in Ukraine. And it comes against the backdrop of another headline from Vladimir Putin, uh, who says Russia is open to a, quote, reasonable compromise, unquote, but we'll make no concessions to bring this war to an end. Yeah, we just heard from Admiral John Kirby, who, of course, is a spokesperson uh, with the White House, who said they do think the number of North Korean troops could number in about 3,000 or more. So serious considerations to be had on the European continent right now as we look to the future of this conflict and, frankly, how it could change ultimately depending on who becomes president of the United States in January. We could see very different approaches under a Kamala Harris administration or another Donald Trump administration. We understand that the differences between the two potential outcomes here have been a well-discussed topic in Washington this week at the annual meetings of the IMF at World Bank, the fall meetings of that. And that's where we want to go to now, live from the IMF, where we're joined by Paolo Gentiloni. He is European Commissioner for Economic and Financial Affairs. Commissioner, welcome back to Bloomberg TV and Radio. It's great to have you on Balance of Power, sir. If we could just start right there, as I know that this has been talked about uh, in Washington this week. How are you, from an economic perspective, considering the two outcomes here, what a Donald Trump presidency could mean economically for Europe versus a Harris one? Uh, well, First of all, I'm talking about the European perspective, not sure. the overall IMF meetings perspective. On the European side, I would say uh, the diplomatic and official answer is very clear. We uh, will work with our American partners independently for who will win the elections. Uh, substantially, we know that we had a very good cooperation with the Biden administration because the Biden administration was able not only to protect the American interests, but also to keep alive and even strengthen in some way uh, the multilateral uh, framework, which is important uh, for us. So the fact that they decided to go back to the Paris Agreement on climate change, the agreement on corporate taxation, uh, the WTO. So this is something that the European Union is uh, considering very important and this is the legacy of the Biden administration and we hope to continue to work together with our American partners keeping the multilateral system alive. 
Well, so if we're talking about systems of multilateralism and multilateral trade specifically, you mentioned the WTO there. Are potential tariffs your greatest concern, Commissioner, not just for direct tariffs that could be placed on European goods, but potentially just greater protect protectionism in general? If there is a, a outright trade war, for example, between the U.S. and China, how could that, by extension, impact Europe? Well, I think that this is one of the uh, real risks that our global economy is running. Because here in the IMF and World Bank meetings, we are broadly satisfied because indeed we were able uh, to manage the high inflation. The inflation is now under control despite a low level of growth. But if we look to the future, the risk of the fact that uh, geopolitical tensions, trade tensions, um, tariffs uh, will undermine uh, growth and global trade is particularly strong for Europe because of course the European Union is a big, big, big trade powerhouse. Our trade with the US is 1.6 trillion per year, only goods and services, so it's a mountain that is very important for our economic welfare in the coming years. And this is the reason why we should be very careful in keeping trade open. Of course, having it more secure, as we all are saying now, but secure doesn't mean protectionism and closing trade. Well, and Europe is trying to calibrate tariff policy of its own. I understand that the Commission and China will be continuing conversations around how to avert potentially the more than 35 percent tariff that could go into place on Chinese made EVs. Are you confident that can be averted? And if this does indeed come into place, what economic impact are you gaming out? Well, I think this is something very reasonable proportionate on our side. Um, the reason is uh, Chinese overcapacity in this sector and also subsidies to their industries. Uh, so for us, for the European Union, it was also uh, a learning process. We had until maybe three or four years ago a more uh, optimistic attitude on trade with China. Now we know that to have a level playing field, we need to be much more monitoring how much subsidies are working and how several sectors are uh, affected by overproduction. But again, having this new approach doesn't mean that we will adopt a protectionist attitude because this is something that for the European Union is impossible to adopt. We are confident that it is possible to have a more secure, but to keep trade open. And Commissioner, if we could just widen out and look at broadly the growth picture for Europe right now, how, how strong or weak do you think it is? And when you look at what's happening in particular countries, the slump in Germany specifically, how concerned are you about the drag that could create on the overall Euro area economy? Well, what is happening now is that uh, we are very good in inflation. The last figure in September was 1.7, so well below our 2% target. And we all remember that only two years ago it was a double digit inflation in Europe. So good for inflation, we'll see the next months, but the direction is very clear. Very good in terms of labor market, not good in terms of growth. Growth is too low. Why is growth so low? Well, we have structural problems that we have to invest in innovation, productivity, but also the international situation and the geopolitical risk we were referring to are influencing our level of growth. If you look to some countries, for example, uh, Germany, where growth is particularly low or even negative, this is the, also the impact of the decision that we had to take for geopolitical reasons mm. to abandon Russian cheap gas, to uh, have a new approach 
with global trade, especially with China. Oh, sorry, and it is no surprise that this is affecting some European economies. All right, Commissioner, thank you so much for joining us here on Bloomberg. That is Paolo Gentiloni, European Commissioner for Economic and My Financial friend. Affairs. Appreciate your time, sir. And an important ending note, Joe, as he points to the geopolitical considerations that are factoring into the growth picture for Europe there, namely the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. That's for sure. And this is something we want to talk about with Melinda Herring uh, from the Atlantic Council, Kaylee. We heard from Jamie Dimon on this very delicate moment in Ukraine and the potential, as he sees it, for nuclear war. Let's listen to what he said earlier this week uh, in Washington. He was speaking at the Institute for International Finance. This was just uh, earlier this week, yesterday, in fact, in the nation's capital. Here he is. We have to be quite clear this is, that we can't have a bad outcome there. You know, if you, you, know, you travel around, all the, you know, the, a lot of other nations you know, that border Russia, they're quite worried. You know, and some that don't border Russia are quite worried. And we've never had a situation where man is threatening nuclear blackmail. That's where we start our conversation with the aforementioned Melinda Herring, senior fellow, Atlantic Council, senior advisor uh, for Ukraine at RASM. It's great to see you, Melinda. Welcome back to Bloomberg TV and radio. We have a lot of headlines uh, that are crossing the terminal today, uh, beginning with President Zelensky saying that he expects Russia to deploy North Korean troops inside Ukraine over the course of this weekend. In fact, as soon as Sunday, he says, possibly on Monday. How would that change the dynamic on the battlefield? Hey, Joe, thanks for having me back. Look, this is a major escalation. According to the Ukrainians, they expect 12,000 North Korean troops to be deployed to, to, on Russia's side. They will be wearing Russian uniforms and they will be under the command uh, of the Russian military. So this, this is a worrisome major escalation. The South Koreans are tearing their hair out calling the North Koreans to, to, to go home, and also saying that they may put some intelligence uh, muscle on the Ukrainian side as a result. Well, as we consider the muscle on the Ukrainian side, what, what response would be needed uh, to be able to adequately withstand this additional military personnel that could be used to fortify Russia's own position, Melinda? Should the U.S. be considering other forms of aid? Thanks for that question. So it's time for the United States to take off the remaining restrictions that it's put on the long range missiles that the United States has given to Ukraine. We've tied the Ukrainians hands behind their backs. There are many restrictions and they're not allowed to strike deep into Russia. And it doesn't make sense why we're we're forcing the Ukrainians to fight this way uh, when they now have other other nations fighting on their behalf. So that would be one practical step that I would urge the U.S. government to make. It's also time that the U.S. government look at real security guarantees, and this would be NATO membership. That's the only thing that's going to get Ukraine out of this war, and it should be on the table now. Well, Linda, the Wall Street Journal reports that Elon Musk has been speaking on the regular with Vladimir Putin. Uh, not just small talk either. Apparently, uh, in fact, Putin asked Elon Musk, according to this report, at least, which the Kremlin denies, asked Elon Musk to turn off the Starlink service over Taiwan at one point. Bloomberg News asked Donald Trump if he's been in touch with Vladimir Putin since he left the White House. He wouldn't answer the question, but said it would be smart to do so. What does this triangle, this telephone game between the three of them mean for the outcome in Ukraine if Donald Trump is the next president? Joe, this is a humdinger of a story. And the first thing that I would say is that if it's true, it's a major security violation. So if an American has a top security clearance, as Elon Musk does, and he has communication, private communication with any foreign citizen, not Vladimir Putin, any Russian citizen, he has to report that. Now, if he has private communication with Vladimir Putin and he doesn't report it, he's toast. His clearance should be ended immediately. The head of NASA is calling for an investigation, but this is a major, right. this is a major security violation. It's a major, uh, it, it puts U.S. national interests at stake. Remember, Musk owns the Twitter, the former Twitter platform X. Mm -hmm. He also is in charge of SpaceX, and he has he's in charge of Starlink. The U.S. government has more than a hundred contracts with him. In the last year, that that totaled three billion dollars. There's 17 federal agencies that work with Elon Musk. So this is really shocking, and it's something that needs to be looked into immediately. Melinda, we just have a minute left here, but where do you expect this conflict will be on January 20th when a new president takes office? 
Kaylee, that is the money question. It all depends on who is elected. If you're looking at the race from just a Ukraine lens, the difference between the two candidates couldn't be more stark. Harris supports Ukraine full stop. Trump does not support Ukraine. In fact, he said that the war was a genius idea, and I expect him to undermine U.S. leadership and look at ways to undermine our, our, our part in NATO as well. All right, Melinda Herring, always great to have you here on Balance of Power. She is non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and senior advisor at Razum for Ukraine. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.